Hello everyone, welcome back to Ancient Greece and Rome. In this video, we're going to discuss Archaic Period Greece, as well as Early Classical Greece, from about the 800s BCE to about the mid-400s BCE. First, we're going to discuss Greek colonies during this period. Then we're going to discuss the definition of Greek spiritual and religious beliefs, specifically the Greek pantheon of gods and goddesses. We'll also discuss how Greek religious and spiritual beliefs impacted their death customs and burial rituals during this period. Then we'll discuss the Olympic Games and how this spiritual event brought the Greek people together. After that, We'll discuss archaic and early classical Greek material culture. We'll discuss Greek pottery and sculpture and architecture and how these forms evolved over time. Then we'll discuss agriculture and life outside of the cities of Greece. We'll discuss labor and class in ancient Greece and how changes to Greek society during the archaic and early classical periods gave rise the emergence of Greek democracy in Athens. Finally, we'll finish our discussion by discussing the Greco-Persian Wars of the late Archaic and early Classical years. We'll discuss the structure of the Greek city-states militaries, specifically the hoplite system. We'll talk about how the hoplite system reflected the values of Greek culture during the Archaic and Early Classical years. Then we'll discuss the course of the Greco-Persian Wars and the conclusion of this conflict and how the end of this war set Greece up for its High and Late Classical period and eventually its Hellenistic period as well. These periods will be the subject of future videos. As you remember from our previous video, Many Greeks fled the Greek mainland during the Dorian invasion and after. They set up colonies, settlements across the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. In these colonies, these Greek refugees transmitted elements of their culture to the local people. This transmission and mixing of cultures was most evident in places like Sicily and Italy, called Magna Graecia by the Greeks of the time. In these settlements, the Greeks also learned from the indigenous peoples as well. This is particularly true of the settlements in places like Asia Minor and North Africa. The Greeks of the early Iron Age and Archaic period fled the chaos of mainland Greece. They traveled by sea establishing new colonies across the Mediterranean in places like North Africa, as well as further flung areas like what is now Spain, France, and Italy. They used ships like the one shown here to make these voyages. As I mentioned before, travel in the ancient world was much easier over water than it was over land. These colonies, some of which grew into true cities by child's parameters, exported Greek culture across the Mediterranean. In these colonies, the Greeks also came into contact with other people groups, like the Iberians of what is now Spain, the Phoenicians of the Levantine coast in North Africa, and the Celts of what is now France, as well as the Etruscans and Latins of the Italian peninsula. These people would become the Romans. The Greeks brought their material culture with them. Here is an example. The Temple of Acragas in Sicily, built around the 500s BCE. You'll notice that this temple was built according to the Doric order of architecture. We'll discuss more about the Doric order later in this video.
This is the remains of the Greek colony of Massilia. It's in uh, the present-day city of Marseille, France. Uh, these ruins date to about the 600s BCE. Uh, the Romans also would inhabit this site, as do the French today, highlighting the um, strategic importance and uh, ideal location of uh, this Greek colony. Some more important points to consider um, when discussing Greek colonization. Remember, colonization uh, for the Greeks began during what we often call the Dark or the Iron or Pre-Archaic period in Greek history, but colonization will continue uh, well into the Archaic period. Um, the Greeks initially fled the chaos of the Greek mainland during the so-called Dark Age, but over, over time this colonization would evolve as uh, the city-states, or the polis, as the Greeks would have called them, look to uh, basically send away uh, excess population, particularly uh, young males, that uh, there was no work for them, there were no opportunities for them in the, the polis and the city-state, they'd be sent to establish a colony somewhere else. And a lot of these young men did not go willingly, they did not want to leave uh, the polis, the city-state, but they basically uh, were forced out by uh, the city-state. So uh, these people would go out and they would set up colonies, and these colonies were meant to be semi-independent from the metropole, or uh, the, the founding mother city-state. Um, still though, the colonies were expected to trade with the metropole and to be allies with the metropole during wars. Um, this, this system of colonization is a lot less centralized than the uh, European colonization of the early modern period that you might be more familiar with. Uh, and colonization uh, reinforced a lot of uh, important uh, kind of Greek uh, cultural ideas. One idea that's uh, reinforced by colonization is the idea of pan-Hellenism. Um, pan as in uh, meaning all in this case, all Hellenism, sort of an all-encompassing form of uh, Hellenism or Greek culture, regardless of whether you were uh, Spartan or Athenian or living in a colony like uh, Massilia, you were still Greek. Uh, there's a shared language, uh, there's a shared culture, there's a shared heritage. Although, of course, uh, there is quite a bit of variation within Greek culture. There's different dialects of Greek that are spoken. And uh, as you'll see in this uh, slideshow, there's uh, other variations, particularly between city-states like Athens and Sparta. Colonization would also reinforce and uh, make even more important uh, two other very important uh, Greek values, uh, Xenia and Adate. Uh, Xenia basically means guest and foreigner friendship in Greek. Um, Greeks believe that uh, they ought to treat their guests with kindness, even barbarians. Um, and these uh, interactions uh, through the colonies with non-Greek people would have strengthened the Greeks' uh, belief and use of Xenia. At the same time, there's also rules uh, as to how guests ought to behave uh, with their hosts. So it's a two-way street, Xenia. And then there's Adate. Now, Adate uh, roughly translates to beauty or excellence. Um, the pursuit of beauty, the pursuit of excellence, it's something that's pursued by both men and women in uh, Greek society in, in some different ways. And uh, the Greeks learned a lot of things from non-Greeks, from barbarians. Uh, this is facilitated by their colonization, living far away from the Greek homeland. At the same time, the Greeks also had a major impact and influence on uh, the non-Greek and barbarian peoples they came into contact with um, in their colonies. This is especially true of uh, Magna Graecia, or the Greek colonies in uh, what is now Italy, uh, where the Greeks had an influence on uh, the other people living on the Italian peninsula, like the Etruscans, and of course, the Romans. One element of Greek culture that shows Adate, the pursuit of excellence, but also a mixing of Greek and non-Greek ideas is the alphabet, the Greek alphabet. The Greek alphabet is the oldest continually in use alphabet in the world. It would inspire uh, later Cyrillic, Gothic, and Latin alphabets. Um, the people who become the Romans, they developed their own alphabet based on the Greek alphabet. There's also evidence that uh, some of the people that the Greeks came in contact with, like the Celts, used the Greek alphabet uh, for trade purposes. And of course, um, the Greek alphabet comes from the older Phoenician alphabet, which we'll talk about in a moment. But the Greek alphabet greatly facilitated um, the Greeks' trade and their colonization. Alphabets um, allow for writing. Writing is used for uh, 
recording of goods, recording of business transactions, but also the uh, Greek alphabet is a lot easier to use than other uh, written languages and writing systems in the ancient world. And because it's easier to use, it allows for the development of Greek literature, uh, things like epic poetry, the poetry of Homer uh, that we discussed in a previous video. Um, it allows for the development of theater, which we'll discuss in a future video, as well as uh, scientific and uh, philosophical texts. So uh, the Greek alphabet is a, a very important development that is going to um, bolster Greek culture. Here's a diagram showing the development of the Phoenician alphabet and how the Greeks uh, adapted the Phoenician alphabet for their own use and then how the Romans adapted the Greek alphabet for their use over time. Uh, you'll see that the Phoenician alphabet evolves from a series of uh, Canaanite uh, pictographs or pictograms. For example, uh, the symbol uh, dig for fish eventually will become uh, delta for the, um, the Greeks. You can see the uh, evolution of these symbols. Now we'll talk about uh, ancient Greek uh, polytheism and ancient Greek religious and spiritual beliefs, which, like their written language, like their alphabet, um, are a mixture of uh, ideas from other cultures. We'll start by talking about the uh, Olympian pantheon, the 12 Olympian gods. They're called the Olympians because they live on Mount Olympus, and they include Zeus, god of lightning and king of the gods, shown here, we've talked about uh, quite a bit. Uh, Poseidon, uh, god of the sea, sometimes he's referred to as being a brother of Zeus in certain mythological stories, a very important deity to the um, ancient Greeks, a seafaring people. Athena, um, goddess of wisdom and war, who according to some legends um, emerged from the head of Zeus. Uh, Ares, uh, god of war. Uh, the Greeks have two gods or two deities for war. We'll talk about some of the differences between Athena and Ares uh, on another, sl another slide. Artemis, goddess of the hunt, a very important uh, deity in a culture that's uh, practicing hunting. Hermes, the uh, messenger god. Uh, Hera, um, the queen of the, of the gods, uh, wife of Zeus, a uh, beleaguered wife of Zeus, because uh, throughout Greek mythology, Zeus has uh, relationships with a lot of other people uh, in addition to his wife. Uh, Demeter, uh, goddess of agriculture, very important for an agricultural society like the Greeks. Hephaestus, god of um, ironworking and metalworking, a very important deity. Apollo, a um, god of wisdom, but also a god of learning and science and education. We'll talk more about Apollo later in this video. Uh, Dionysus, um, god of wine and god of uh, partying and festivities, a, uh, a, lot, a very fun god to study. And of course, Aphrodite, goddess of love. Aphrodite was married to Hephaestus, but she had a um, relationship with Ares. And not shown on this slide is Hades, god of the dead, because he says, Hades does not live on Mount Olympus. He lives in the underworld. The Greek religion was based around the worship of the Olympian gods and goddesses. Some scholars argue that there were 12, others argue there were 13 Olympians, depending on whether Dionysus, the god of wine, is considered to be a part of the Olympian pantheon. The Greek religion may have evolved from older Indo-European spiritualities, especially the god Zeus, shown here on the left side of this slide, who bears many similarities to Thor and Odin, sky gods of the Germanic peoples. Zeus is much more like Thor and Odin in the respect that he wields lightning bolts. He's very different from the Egyptian and Mesopotamian sky deities, Amun-Ra and Anu, whom we discussed in previous videos. There are, however, some influences from the ancient Near East and Egypt, particularly on the goddesses Athena, Aphrodite, and Artemis. This sculpture is believed to be of Athena, and you can see the similarities in the sculpture work on her face to the Inanna mask 
we viewed in a previous video. In spite of some of these similarities, there are some very significant differences between the Greek pantheon and the gods and goddesses of the ancient Near East and ancient Egypt. In the ancient Greek pantheon, there's less combination with animals, although there are some exceptions, like the minor god Pan, who was half human, or half human form, and half caprine goat form. The Greeks believed that their gods were far more civilized than those of the ancient Near East and of Egypt. If you read the myths the Greeks tell about their gods, though, their gods were really not very civilized at all, especially not Zeus, the king of the gods. Deities like Zeus had constant relations with human women, and many of these relationships were non-consensual. Some scholars argue that the ancient Greek pantheon, particularly elements like the sexual relationships that the male gods had with human females, may represent the patriarchal nature of Greek society. In spite of these stories and myths, though, women were allowed to become priestesses, which was one of the only ways that women could have power outside of the home in ancient Greek society. The gods lived atop Mount Olympus, highlighting the role that Greece's rugged geography played in the development of their civilization. The gods were a product of their environment, just as much as they were a product of the beliefs and desires of the ancient Greek people. Now we'll briefly discuss uh, the differences between Ares, god of war, and Athena, goddess of war and wisdom. Ares was meant to convey the more negative aspects of warfare, the violence, destruction, uh, murder. Um, as mentioned before, Ares had a uh, relationship with Aphrodite, even though she was married to uh, another god. Uh, he, he's meant to show the more capricious and the more negative and dangerous aspects of war. Um, Athena, on the other hand, is uh, meant to show wisdom and the uh, perhaps you could say the more positive aspects of war tactics strategy planning ahead um, the planning of battles and things like that um, and both both of these gods have their own symbols um, highlighting the more negative aspects of Ares. he's symbolized by things like dragons and dogs and vultures athena is symbolized by uh, Owls, uh, you know, the symbol of wisdom, the spear, and uh, the olive tree. Uh, this olive tree, of course, um, is a symbol for Athena because in a contest between uh, Athena and Poseidon, a mythical contest between Athena and Poseidon for the city of Athens, uh, or what would become the city of Athens, um, Poseidon gave the uh, people that would become the Athenians a salt spring. Um, spring full of salty water which was useless to them but Athena gave them an olive tree which was very useful because it olives could be eaten and then they could produce olive oil so you see that um, Athena is uh, the goddess of warfare in the sense that she's the goddess of careful planning strategy tactics planning ahead in the case of an olive tree that takes years to grow Whereas Ares is the god of war and god of uh, the, the more negative aspects of war, uh, violence, destruction, etc. And there's uh, many temples to Athena uh, throughout the Greek world, but there's not nearly, uh, proportionally speaking, as many temples to Ares, uh, just because he's uh, the not favorite uh, god or deity of war. The archaic and early classical Greeks believed the Olympians were the offspring of an older set of deities known as the Titans. The Titans were much more elemental and pantheistic than the Olympians. The Titans included beings like Uranus, Father Sky, and Gaia, Mother Earth, as well as Cronus, Father Time. Some of the most important of the Titans were Cronus, mentioned before, and Atlas, shown here on the right-hand side of the slide. Cronus would eat his children to prevent them from conspiring against them, but he was defeated by Zeus. The triumph of the Olympians may have symbolized Greek spirituality's shift 
from an older pantheism to a more organized religion. The Greek myths held that after the Olympians defeated the Titans, they banished them to places like Tartarus, which was the ancient Greek religion's equivalent of hell. Or they forced the Titans to complete laborious tasks. Atlas, for example, had to hold up the earth. Archaic and early classical Greek burial customs and funerary rituals reflected the spiritual beliefs, but also the social beliefs, of contemporary Greek people. The Greeks of these periods believed that the dead could not take many things with them into the afterlife. The tombs of these period was, were smaller. Most people were buried in cemeteries, like this one on the right, after a brief period of mourning, as shown in this image on the left. The Greeks did not mummify their dead. There's also less evidence of secondary burials, as was done in the Mycenaean period. Secondary burials, in archaeological terms, occur when a body is buried and allowed to decompose, and then its bones are placed in another tomb or catacomb alongside the bones of many other individuals. The Greeks of the Archaic and Early Classical period shifted away from this style of burial. We don't really know why. Perhaps the Greeks of this period developed more of a fear of the dead, or perhaps they just didn't want to go through the effort of having to pick through the bones of the deceased people. Ancient Greek spiritual beliefs had rituals to help guide the dead away from the physical world and towards the afterlife. But these rituals and guidelines were far less extensive than those of the Egyptians discussed previously. At certain points in history, the Greeks would bury their dead with a coin in the mouth so the spirit of the deceased could pay Charon, the boatman, to pilot them across the river Styx into the underworld, the realm of the dead. But the dead were not buried with other possessions, as other civilizations had done. The simpler burial rites of the Archaic and Early Classical period, compared to the Tholos tombs of the Mycenaean period, highlight the more egalitarian nature of Archaic Greek and Early Classical Greek society. The aristocracy was a lot weaker, and there were just a lot more middle class and everyday Greek people living their lives. Now we'll discuss the Greek underworld, also known as Hades. The spirits would cross the river Styx after paying Charon, the boatman, seen here at left. There are other rivers in the underworld as well, each with meanings of their own. Then the spirit of the dead would pass the three-headed dog Cerberus, who kept spirits from escaping Hades, seen here on the right. Sometimes humans of great power, like Heracles, also known as Hercules, would fight against Cerberus and chain him up so that they could go back and forth between the underworld and the physical world. The spirits would enter the underworld and they'd be judged for their actions in life by Hades, god of the dead. Good people would go on to Elysium, which was like the ancient Greek version of heaven. The bad people would be punished in Tartarus, being tortured or forced to complete laborious tasks for eternity. Here's a piece of pottery that shows Sisyphus, who was trapped in Tartarus and forced to carry boulders for eternity. People trapped in Tartarus were also tortured as well, being dismembered by other animals, as among many other ways that they were tormented. Here's a simple map showing the layout of the underworld. Here's the river Styx. Here's Charon's Ferry. Here's Cerberus in the gate. Here's the Pavilion of Judgment, where the souls of the dead would be judged. The good souls would go to the Isle of the Blessed, also known as Elysium. The bad souls would have to go into Tartarus and then would go on to eternal punishment. One way that Greeks could live a good, virtuous life and thus have a better afterlife 
for themselves was by making sacrifices to the gods. Uh, the ancient Greeks believed that they could honor the gods and feed the gods by sacrificing animals to them. Uh, the animal's flesh would be burned up and uh, the ashes and smoke would rise through the air to uh, go to Mount Olympus to feed the gods. Uh, sacrificial animals in uh, Greek culture included things like sheep, but also uh, swine and uh, cattle or bulls. And uh, these sacrifices would be paid for by Greeks who had some wealth. Um, they would purchase animals based on uh, how much wealth they had. Obviously, a, a pig or a sheep is going to be a lot less expensive than a bull. Um, and these, um, these animals would be led uh, to the temple where they would be sacrificed by the priests. Before uh, the sacrifice ritual, the animal would be honored and would be decorated with uh, uh, jewelry and things like that. Uh, the animal was supposed to uh, not be afraid. It was not supposed to be resisting um, its, its uh, impending demise. The idea was the animal was supposed to consent to being uh, sacrificed. What they would often do is take a little bit of water and uh, flick it basically into the eyes of uh, the animal. And the sacrificial victim, the sacrificial animal within, trying to get the water out of its eyes, would nod its head, consenting to be sacrificed. And uh, these sacrificial events, they were uh, basically, they were public rituals, and they were put on by the wealthier people. Uh, these were religious festivals for the public. They were public gatherings. Uh, the rich, uh, the aristocrats, as the Greeks would have called them, uh, would support uh, poorer people who would come to these uh, festivals and then they would all together have a, a meal of, of meat from the sacrificial animals. Whatever meat was not uh, burned and offered to the gods would then be consumed by the attendees of these festivals. And these events were called liturgies. And so wealthy Greeks, by making sacrifices, they would not only gain support from the gods, they would gain support from uh, everyday uh, commoner Greeks as well. The ancient Greeks of the Archaic and Early Classical period believed that they could learn the will of the gods by consulting oracles. The most famous of these oracles was the Pythia, priestess of Delphi, who supposedly received visions from Apollo, the god of wisdom. Some archaeologists think the Pythia may have experienced hallucinations from toxic gases that leaked to the surface in Delphi. Priests would interpret the Pythia's hallucinations, saying that they were visions given to her from their deities. A city was built around the oracle site as pilgrims and travelers visited the Pythia, hoping to learn the will of the gods, as attested by documentary sources from the period. Here is the foundation of part of the city of Delphi. As you can see, it's a very extensive settlement, settled in, in the mountains of Greece. Here's a reconstruction of the foundation of the Oracle building where the Pythia spent most of her time. These images on the right hand side of the slide show her being exposed to toxic gases as the priests look on and interpret her visions. The ancient Greeks participated in the Olympic Games right around the year 776 BCE. The Olympic Games would be held in the town of Olympia every four years to honor the gods, specifically Zeus. Other gods would be honored as well. Greek men and boys from all the city states and colonies were permitted to compete. The Olympic Games were an important cultural event as well, especially for Greek people spread across the Mediterranean basin. It might be the one time these people would come together in common cause to worship their gods and to compete in athletic competitions. Events in the Olympic Games included things like running, jumping, wrestling, horse and chariot racing, discus and javelin throwing as well. These games may also have been a form of military training especially in events like chariot and horse racing, javelin throwing, and wrestling. Most events were completed in the nude, 
women were barred from competing in the Olympic competitions and had separate athletic events. The Olympics continued until the year 393 of the Common Era, when they were banned by the Roman Empire under Theodosius I. Here are some contemporary Greek pottery illustrations showing Olympic competitions. On the left, you can see a young athlete preparing for the long jump. The jumpers would hold weights in their hands so they could jump further. On the right, we can see a wrestling match between two competitors. Biting and gouging of the eyes was illegal in these events. As you can see, the referee is about to strike the competitors for breaking these rules. And of course, all the athletes are competing nude. Here is a plan of the Olympic site at Olympia. Basically, it's the ancient Olympian village. As you can see from the color of the buildings, this site was inhabited continuously for centuries and was expanded over the years. Here we can see the archaic buildings are fairly simple, but more buildings are added during the classical and Hellenistic periods. Classical, of course, in orange, Hellenistic in yellow. Even some buildings are added during the Roman period as well. Here are some slides showing the evolution of the architecture at Olympia. Once again, highlighting the long-term use and occupation of this site. On the right, we can see a Doric column. On the left, we see a series of Ionic columns. Here are some artists' recreations of Olympic events. On the left, you can see the hoplite race. The hoplite race was one of the few events in which the athletes competed wearing some kind of clothing. In this case, armor. It was an armored race, hence the term hoplite race. Here we see another image of Greek wrestlers. Athletes, especially wrestlers, would rub their bodies with olive oil before competing. The olive oil was a skin protectant, protecting them from cuts and scratches. It also made cleaning dirt off of their bodies more easily after they had competed. Here you also see the referee observing the fight to make sure both of the athletes play fair. Winners of Olympic events would receive a crown made from either laurel or olive leaves, as shown by this slide. They symbolically received this award, this crown, from Nike, the goddess of victory, shown here in the, with the wings. Now that we've talked about the Olympic Games, I want to talk a little bit more about Adate again and its meanings in Greek culture. As mentioned previously, Adate uh, meant excellence, but it meant excellence in all things. Uh, it meant basically being excellent, being beautiful, but being well-rounded, being well-proportioned, um, being good at many different things, what we might call being a Renaissance man. So ancient Greek athletes, their goal was not just to be good in one event, but to be good in multiple events. Unlike uh, nowadays where uh, Olympic athletes uh, usually only perform in one sport. And of course, uh, Adate um, extends to uh, beyond athletics. It also uh, basically means virtue as well. Uh, the Greeks wanted to achieve Adate in mind, body, and spirit. Uh, they achieved Adate in uh, body, by participating in sports, by exercising, by training for military service. They achieved Adate in spirit by worshiping the gods uh, and being a good citizen. And they achieved Adate in the mind by uh, studying and learning. There's also some gendered qualities to uh, Adate as well. Both men and women pursue Adate, but in slightly different ways. Uh, men would seek Adate through their military service, through their sense of honor, uh, keeping their word, uh, sports, uh, and then maintaining their, their culture's uh, sort of male beauty standards, being athletic, uh, having a nice, neatly trimmed hair, having a nice, neatly trimmed beard, for example, wearing nice clothing. Uh, 
uh, women um, sought audite by uh, raising children and, and being good mothers, running the home, uh, also by practicing xenia, um, basically a friendship towards guests, uh, and then, of course, by maintaining their own uh, culture's female beauty standards, um, wearing nice clothing, having nice hair. We'll talk more about um, ancient Greek uh, clothing and beauty standards on another slide. And of course, arete is an important value throughout the Greek civilization, and it's even an important value to uh, modern day Greeks as well. Now we'll discuss archaic and early classical Greek pottery. Early in the archaic period, in about the 800s and 700s BCE, potters began moving away from the geometric styles of earlier periods the so-called Dark Age slash Early Iron Age. The styles of pottery in the Early Iron Age were very geometric. They did not feature human or animal figures, just designs. Archaic potters began to feature human and animal subjects on their ceramics, although these figures were very primitive and would evolve over time. Initially, there was a clear ancient nor'eastern near eastern influence called the orientalizing style by later scholars. Greek scholars would develop their own styles over time, coming up with the black Corinth style around the 7th century BCE and the red Athens style around 525 BCE. The ceramic seen on this slide is an early archaic design featuring primitive human subjects with geometric patterns as well. The first important pottery style that archaic Greek potters developed was the black figure style developed around the 7th century BCE. Human animal figures are portrayed mostly in black. The backgrounds are lighter. Over time, the style of black figure pottery becomes more detailed as potters learned or rather relearned to make incisions, etchings in their pots to make their designs stand out. I say relearned because earlier Greek cultures did make incisions in their pottery, as we saw in a previous video. As the potters of this period became more skilled, they learned to represent action in their pottery, like Olympic contests seen in this left hand image, or battle scenes seen here on the right. Here are some close ups of black figure pottery. As you can see, the etchings and incisions allow the potters to make their figures more lifelike and to give them a sense of movement as well, as can be seen in both of these images. Over a century later, red figure pottery would emerge around 525 BCE. The figures in red figure pottery are not actually red. They're more of a yellowish orange color. But the lighter color of the figures allows for much more detail. There's also more intricate incisions to represent shading as well. It makes these figures almost look 3D to the viewer. The potters of red figure pottery achieved this look through use, the use of paints, but also by mixing different types of clay darker clay and lighter clay. Firing different types of clay can be difficult in order to keep the pots from cracking during the firing process, highlighting the increasing skill of Greek potters towards the end of the archaic period. Red figure pottery is also much more likely to portray women as human subjects. This may be because the archaic Greeks, just like the Mycenaeans 
and the Minoans preferred to portray women with lighter colors rather than darker colors. Here are some additional examples of red figure pottery. As you can see, the level of detail on human and animal figures in red figure pottery is much, much higher because the potter can use etching and incision in multiple different colors to really make these figures pop and look lifelike. As mentioned before, women are more likely to feature in red figure pottery. Now that we've discussed ancient Greek ceramics during the archaic and early classical period, I want to talk about uh, Greek sculpture during the Archaic and Early Classical period. And Greek sculpture during these periods, um, it's initially defined by what is called the Orientalizing tradition. Um, basically, the Greeks borrowing um, styles from Near Eastern cultures, including ancient Egypt and uh, ancient Near Eastern societies. And these um, Early sculptures, um, especially what are called the Kuri sculptures, um, they have a very strong um, orientalizing style. And they're very um, simple sculptures. They're very stiff. They have a uh, few variations in their poses. And they're not um, as anatomically realistic, uh, very stylized, compared to later uh, Greek sculptures that you see in like the classical, high classical, and uh, Hellenistic periods. And there are male um, Cori statues, and there are female um, Cori statues. And you see elements of the Orientalizing tradition in the pose of the Cori statues, um, one foot in front of the other with the weight evenly divided between two legs. This is a very common Egyptian sculpture style. Um, arms uh, tight at the side, fists clenched. The Egyptians make uh, statues of men and women a lot like this, and it seems that the Greeks are copying this Egyptian style um, during the Archaic period um, and early Classical period. They're also copying um, other Middle Eastern uh, civilizations as well, which we'll see on uh, the next couple of slides. Over time, though, um, Greek sculptors will begin to experiment. They'll make their sculptures more anatomically realistic, uh, more lifelike, uh, better um, knowledge of anatomy, uh, sculpting. Uh, they're getting more sophisticated in uh, how they're chiseling uh, their stone. And they're also gaining a better understanding of statics. And statics basically is the physics of uh, building and construction and of uh, sculptures, making th things that can hold up their own weight and not collapse. As the Greeks get better with statics and sculpting, as they learn more about anatomy, they can make sculptures that look a lot more lifelike, that are in different poses, and really they create the Greek sculptures that we think of today. And I'll show that evolution on the next couple of slides. Um, there'll be new poses. Um, they'll move away from just this stiff standing pose. One pose they'll introduce um, is the contrapposto. Um, basically the contrapposto is a pose where uh, the weight is not evenly divided between the two feet. As the Greeks get to be better sculptors, they can put more weight on one foot uh, as opposed to the other and not have the sculpture collapse. Uh, throughout this period, though, um, the Greeks like to pose their male figures in the nude, but they do not like to pose their female figures in the nude. Um, you don't see nude uh, female figures until much later in Greek history. And the images on this slide are um, orientalizing style Greek sculptures of twins. And you can see the clear Egyptian influence between the orientalizing Greek sculptures and e Egyptian sculptures. And I'll show some more examples on the next few slides. Here are some earlier uh, examples of Kuri statues. And we don't exactly know why the Greeks made these Kuri statues. Um, were they simply art for art's sake, or did they have some kind of uh, ritual or spiritual meaning? We don't know for sure. Um, many of these statues were found 100 or more years ago, 
so the archaeological context in which they've been found has been lost. Um, the layer of strata they were buried in, other artifacts around um, the statue that could have uh, helped archaeologists determine its purpose, those things have been lost. I suspect, though, that they were meant to have some kind of religious uh, connotation. I think the larger life-sized um, quarry statues, those that are about uh, two meters or about six-ish feet tall, were probably meant to represent various uh, Greek gods. Um, but I think the smaller ones that are about three feet or one meter high and smaller they're more like figurines, and they may have been actually uh, votives. Basically, uh, you would make this statue as an offering to a god rather than having it represent uh, the god himself. Anyway, on the left-hand side is a um, quarry from 600 BCE. Uh, there's been some damage to its face, but you can see that um, the face is done in a very Near Eastern style, very... Um, a style of um, eyes and a hairstyle that's very similar to what you would see um, in like Babylonian, Assyrian, or even uh, Persian uh, sculptures. Uh, also, the uh, detailing on the muscles, it's very, very defined. This looks a lot like uh, Assyrian style statues. And again, these quarry are uh, in the nude. Uh, the next one um, here is often known as the uh, New York um, Quarry because it's at a uh, museum in, in New York. And it's from a little bit later, uh, 590 to 580, so shortly after the one on the far left. And um, its musculature is a little bit less defined. I think it looks much more uh, like it's from uh, the Egyptian uh, version of the Orientalizing tradition as opposed to the... Uh, Mesopotamian, Assyrian, Babylonian style. Uh, the muscles are a bit softer, a bit more gracile. The expression on the face of this statue is very placid, a slight smile, eyes closed, very uh, Egyptian in, in its uh, facial features. The next one on the uh, right here, um, I showed another version of, of this um, statue on the previous slide. It was uh, a pair of twins, actually, and it's from about 580 BC. And it also, I think, is much more of the um, Egyptian orientalizing tradition rather than the Mesopotamian um, orientalizing tradition. And uh, on the far right here is a later um, um, cor uh, Cori statue. Um, it's from about 580 to 560 BC. Here you can see that um, they're getting a little bit better at um, sculpting the muscles of the statues. It's a little bit looser, a little bit more anatomically realistic. Instead of having just a very blank uh, expression on the face, um, this one has more of a happy face, a happy expression. So the Greek sculptors over time, they're getting a little bit more sophisticated and they're beginning to develop their own kind of Greek style of sculpture. And we'll show this transition on the next slide as well. Here are some uh, other quarry statues. These are a little bit later. Uh, this one, unfortunately, has been damaged, but it gives you an idea of what they were looking uh, like about the 540s, the mid 500s or so uh, BCE. The uh, sculpting of the muscles is getting it to be a bit more realistic. Um, the next one uh, here um, from 530 um, or so BCE shows a much more uh, anatomically realistic um, um, person. Although the sculptor is still using the very rigid one, one leg before the other, arms tight at the side um, pose. This is another example, um, the Munich uh, Choreos. It's from 525 BCE, and here um, the statue is shown not with long hair, but with uh, short hair in more of a, uh, we would say, a Greek hairstyle. So here you can see that over time, the Greeks are beginning to develop their own sculptural traditions. And this last one here, um, instead of having the arms at the side, the arms are extended. So the Greeks are moving away from the very uh, stiff, static, uh, older orientalizing style and really beginning to uh, bring their own styles into their sculpture. Um, 
work as the uh, archaic period uh, goes on and then the early classical period begins. As the archaic period is ending and the early classical period is beginning, you can really see that the Greek sculptors have come into their own. Um, they have developed their own uh, traditions for sculptures. They're making much more anatomically realistic, much more lifelike sculptures in a variety of poses. You can see that contrapposto is being used as well. Um, this uh, piece here is supposed to be a, a young man uh, tying his hair up. Unfortunately, uh, his arms have uh, broken away, but they would have been tying a headband. This is a, a bronze, actually, of Apollo. Um, it's from somewhere between the 530s and 480s uh, BCE. But instead of having arms tied at the side, um, his arms are reaching out to the viewer. And um, the last piece we're going to show here, which I think is very interesting, is um, it's called the Throwing Artemisian Bronze. It's a figure uh, throwing something. Um, originally, it was thought that this was uh, Zeus uh, casting a lightning bolt. Um, you can imagine uh, Zeus uh, casting a lightning bolt here out of his out of his uh, hand. I'll switch to a different color that's more easy to see. But um, others suggest that actually it's uh, not Zeus, but it's uh, Poseidon, and that Poseidon is uh, using some kind of uh, trident that's associated with um, that deity. I think, though, that it's, it's more logical to assume this is Zeus. This is not a... Um, a very forceful clenched fist kind of grip, the kind of grip you would have if you're holding a, a trident. A trident's basically like a pitchfork. It's much more of a precision uh, grip with the uh, index finger extended here, as you can see. So I'd like to think that this is more likely uh, a bronze of uh, the god Zeus. The only real evidence we have that it could be Poseidon is that it was found near the sea. But once again, you can see the evolution of uh, Greek uh, sculptures during the archaic and early classical periods. Initially, they're following the orientalizing tradition. They're copying uh, Egyptian and other Near Eastern civilizations. But over time, they begin to make their own advancements um, in sculpture, and they begin to really come into their own. And you'll see a similar trend um, with Greek portrayals of women in sculpture. Very early in the uh, archaic period, they're really leaning into the orientalizing tradition. Um, these statues here on the left are very much of the orientalizing tradition. And we don't have as many statues of women um, as we do statues of men, but we can still learn about um, uh, Greek ideas of how women ought to be portrayed in art from uh, the examples we do have. We don't exactly know who is being portrayed in these sculptures. I suspect, though, that they're also meant to be uh, sculptures of a religious purpose. These are probably goddesses. Either they're meant to represent goddesses or they're um, uh, meant to be some kind of offering to a goddess. And the ancient Near Eastern and Egyptian influence is very evident in these early styles. This one on the left uh, was found, we think, in Crete. Sometime It was made sometime in the 600s BCE. And you can see it's very much of an Egyptian style, the uh, clothing that the, uh, the subject of the sculpture is wearing. This um, pose, one arm at the side and then uh, the other arm over the chest. This is a very Egyptian uh, style of pose for sculptures of women. Uh, the next piece here is a, uh, another orientalizing statue of a Greek woman. In this one, she's wearing more um, Near Eastern dress. Um, this uh, hat she's wearing is called a polos. It's very much uh, a uh, Near Eastern uh, style. But you notice the same trend in women's sculptures that you do with men's sculptures. They get a bit more realistic, a bit more um, accurate anatomically. And also you can see that Greek styles begin to uh, come into uh, these, um, these statues of women. They begin to portray women wearing uh, Greek style clothing. And we'll talk a bit more about Greek style clothing uh, later in the video.
although um, the Greek sculptors, they um, had no problems um, sculpting men in the nude. They were not sculpting uh, women in the nude at this point in history. You're not going to see um, nude sculptures of uh, Greek women until late in the classical period and like early in the Hellenistic period. So not for another uh, couple hundred years. And it could be because um, Greek society is very patriarchal at this point. They want uh, women to be uh, covered up. Or it could be because uh, sculptors are just not as comfortable portraying uh, the female form yet. They're still learning more about anatomy. But either way, uh, these early uh, sculptures of women are clothed and then these early sculptures of men are in the nude. Here are some examples of Egyptian sculpture that show the similarities between uh, Egyptian and Greek archaic sculpture or orientalizing sculpture, a uh, particularly uh, orientalizing Greek sculpture of women. Um, the uh, posture of the arm, placement of the arm, uh, placement of the foot, uh, you see these uh, in uh, Greek sculptures of, of women and that they learned a lot of these um, styles from the Egyptians. While we're talking about orientalizing trends in Greek sculpture, I want to talk about uh, what is often called the Black Athena hypothesis. Um, and it started because Greek art, especially sculpture, shows significant Egyptian and Near Eastern influence uh, in the Archaic period, as, as you saw in previous slides. Uh, this has led some scholars to posit that ancient Greek culture is primarily uh, Egyptian and Near Eastern in its origin rather than being uh, European or, or being really a mix of other cultures. And this idea was articulated by a scholar uh, named Martin Bernal in uh, the late 1980s. Uh, previous scholars uh, who Bernal was trying to um, respond to had really sought to minimize the non-Western or non-European influences in Greek culture. And uh, Bernal basically went in the opposite direction and arguably went too far. He argued that uh, Egyptians had even done things like established colonies in Greece and that uh, the best elements of e e Greek culture came from the Egyptians. Uh, archaeological and documentary evidence, however, do not corroborate uh, Bernal's claims. Um, Bernal mainly studied uh, the similarities between Greek and Egyptian mythology, and that was how he came up with his uh, Black Athena hypothesis. Uh, of course, there's a lot of problems uh, with Bernal's uh, thesis. Uh, as you know, uh, Greek culture is a mixture of Indo-European culture, uh, cultures from the ancient Near East, uh, cultures from Egypt, and then the Greeks themselves took all of these ideas and really made them their own and developed a lot of new ideas as well. Uh, you know, things like Adate, Xenia, etc. Uh, and of course, um, the idea that uh, Egyptian and Black are the same thing is is a bit uh, confusing as well. Uh, the ancient Egyptians were a multi-ethnic society. There were sub-Saharan African black people living in Egyptian society, but uh, the average Egyptian uh, had a different um, different skin tone, as you saw in uh, our uh, discussions of ancient Egypt in a previous video. I still thought that uh, Bernal's uh, book is worth mentioning because you may have heard of it. While we're on controversial subjects, I want to talk about uh, pederasty and uh, same-sex relationships in uh, archaic Greece and in early classical Greece as well. And this is a uh, figurine of uh, the god Zeus and uh, Ganymede, his uh, young uh, male lover who, whom Zeus kidnapped. And uh, Zeus kidnapped a lot of uh, people, both uh, men and women, to be lovers, uh, presumably against their will. But we'll continue talking about uh, these relationships on uh, the next slide. Before I begin my discussion of uh, pederasty and uh, same-sex relationships uh, in ancient Greece, I want to say a couple of things first. First of all, I want to say that the ancient Greeks had a more fluid understanding of uh, sexuality than we do today. I also uh, want to say that in many ways the ancient Greeks were uh, very open to same-sex relationships, but in other ways, they had a lot of rules and restrictions about how these 
relationships were to take place. So in other ways, we might say that they were perhaps more homophobic than uh, people today. Really, uh, Greek um, sexual relationships uh, regarding uh, people of the same sex, they show the duality of Greek culture and really its complexities, how you could have uh, two seemingly uh, contradictory things or paradoxical things happening at the same time. So one very common uh, homosexual relationship uh, was uh, the pederasty, and this involved an older man, an Erastes, and a younger man, an Aramenos. Usually there was at least a 10-year age difference between the Erastes and the Aramenos. In uh, ancient Greek visual art, the Erastes is usually portrayed with a beard, whereas the Aramenos is usually portrayed uh, clean-shaven without a beard, or perhaps is meant to portray a young male that cannot yet grow a beard for himself. Uh, the Greeks did not have a word for homosexuality. Um, instead, they, um, you know, they would engage in these relationships and not really be considered gay in the, the modern sense of the word. And that's where the rules about how these relationships were to take place become very important. Uh, Greek society was highly patriarchal, uh, and these, these relationships between men were supposed to prepare uh, teenage males for, for marriage. Uh, men typically would marry in their 30s, and they would marry women that were often in their teens. And uh, you would learn how to be in a relationship by being in a uh, pederasty uh, situation. We might consider this type of relationship to be oppressive today because of the massive age gap between the uh, Erastes and the Aramenos. Also because some of these Arast Aramenoses would have been become um, part of this relationship before they had reached adulthood. Uh, really when they were, were boys. So uh, that's an area, area where we might uh, look back on, on uh, the Greeks in a more critical manner. Uh, within uh, the pederasty relationship, there were very strict rules about uh, how uh, sexual relations were to take place. And not every pederasty relationship was necessarily sexual. But um, the uh, Orestes was not to engage in any kind of sexual act uh, that would put um, the Aramenos in a passive position, in a receiving position, in a what might be called a female position to the uh, uh, the Greeks. That's their terminology, not ours. Um, Same-sex relationships between Greek men and non-Greek men and between slaves were uh, far less regulated because uh, non-Greeks, barbarians, were seen as having less honor um, than, than Greeks. And because slaves... Uh, were slaves. Uh, pederasty will become less common in the uh, classical era, and it was even condemned in some cases by philosophers like Plato, although uh, Plato often sort of changes his opinion about these relationships. Sometimes he has a more positive view of pederasty, at other points he has a more negative view of it. Um, pederastic relationships uh, feature prominently in Greek literature, including Zeus and Ganymede, uh, who I mentioned on a previous slide, also uh, Achilles and Patroclus uh, from the Iliad. Although uh, at the time of uh, Homer, that relationship was not necessarily understood as being sexual, but later Greeks will uh, interpret um, Patroclus and Achilles' relationship as being sexual. And of course, there's other examples of Greek men in uh, homosexual relationships. Uh, which we'll talk about later in the course. By the way, the image on this slide is a fresco from uh, Magna Graecia, from what is now Italy, and it's from the uh, 400s uh, BCE. A little more information about uh, Achilles and Patroclus. Homer did not explicitly define them as being lovers, but later Greeks did and interpreted their relationship as being a uh, romantic one. Uh, if, if their relationship was an example of pederasty, though, it's a departure from the norms of pederasty. Uh, Achilles, uh, who is nearly immortal and was said to be very you know, beautiful and powerful, uh, yet he was younger and uh, you know, better looking than Patroclus. But he was also the dominant figure in the relationship, uh, being that he was nearly immortal. Whereas Patroclus, who would normally be the Erastes, is, is more of the subordinate role. And he basically is just trying to support... Achilles and get him to take part in the Trojan War. Um, in the end, uh, Patroclus's death uh, 
at the hands of uh, Hector of Troy will uh, motivate Achilles to uh, rejoin the Trojan War. He had been kind of protesting and not fighting earlier after Agamemnon took a uh, female uh, servant named uh, Briseis from him. So once again, you're also seeing that if, if Achilles was in a homosexual relationship with Patroclus, he was also trying to have heterosexual relationships as well with people like Briseis. And the image on this slide, of course, is a uh, famous Achilles uh, bandaging Patroclus' wounds. It's from 500 BC, uh, and it's uh, from a cup that's actually in the Berlin Museum. I also want to talk about same-sex relations between women in ancient Greece. Um, if you thought that uh, same-sex relationships between men were taboo and controversial in Greek society with pederasty and all of those rules about how uh, males were supposed to treat each other in sexual relationships, it's even more uh, taboo and more uh, controlled when it comes to uh, uh, same-sex relations between women in ancient Greece. And we think this is a product of the patriarchal nature of, of Greek society. Uh, the best evidence of uh, same-sex desires and uh, relations between women comes from the poetry of Sappho of Lesbos, uh, she lived from 630 to 570 BCE, so solidly in the uh, Archaic period. Uh, she was a poet. Um, most of her uh, work has been lost, and what work we do have from her is pretty fragmentary. And a lot of her poetry features longing and unrequited love between women, uh, because these women would not be allowed to pursue uh, relationships with other women usually because they were married, and uh, in ancient Greek society, men controlled uh, marriage. Scholars debate whether uh, Sappho was a lesbian uh, or if she was bisexual. Lesbian, of course, comes from the term lesbos, where Sappho was from. And remember, the Greeks had a much more fluid idea about sexuality. So some people say that trying to label Sappho as being bisexual or being a lesbian is 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 pointless because she had a she would have had a very different understanding of sexuality when she was alive. And uh, the image on this slide is of uh, Sappho holding a lyre, a ancient Greek musical instrument, uh, similar to a harp. And it's from a, uh, a crater or basically a wine jug at the Munich Museum. Now we can discuss archaic and early classical architecture. The best examples of monumental architecture in the archaic and early classical period are temples. Greek palaces and tombs during this period are less impressive, highlighting the decreased stratification and increased egalitarianism and democracy of the period. Comparatively egalitarian and comparatively democratic by the standards of ancient times, of course. There's three major styles or orders, the Doric, Ionic and Corinthian orders. The Doric order was the oldest and was developed on the Greek mainland. And it's most popular from 750 to 480 BCE. The Ionic order was developed in Ionia, Asia Minor, and it's most popular from about the same period as well, but it spreads to the Greek mainland in the 500s BCE. The Corinthian order was developed in Corinth on the Greek mainland, and it's most popular during the late classical and Hellenistic period, from the 430s into the 300s. Multiple orders could be used in a single edifice slash building. The best example of this is the Parthenon. We'll discuss the Parthenon in our next video. We're going to discuss some earlier examples in this video. Here are some diagrams of the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian orders. These diagrams also contain architectural terminology for the features of these styles. I don't expect you all to know and memorize all of these terms, but I've included them here so that you all can familiarize yourself with them. I'll be using and referencing some of these terms later. In the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian orders, columns are used to hold up 
the building's roof, also known as its entablature. The main part of the column is the shaft. The shaft is often decorated with fluting, seen here in this image. The top of the column is called a capital. The base of the column is called the base or the pedestal. The entablature could be decorated with multiple architectural features, including triglyphs, metopes, and friezes, among others. We'll discuss some more of these architectural features later. Here are some specific features of the Doric and Ionic orders. Both Doric and Ionic columns feature fluting, these grooves on the column shaft. Although their capitals are different, the capitals of Doric columns are much simpler as you can see, comparing the capitals of these two types of columns. Interestingly, the Doric order decorates the frieze with triglyphs, while the Ionic order does not. Also, keep in mind that ancient Greek architects often mixed both orders together in the same building. Here's an example of a temple built according to the Doric order. It is the temple of Paestum in Italy, also known as Magna Graecia. It was built between 550 and 450 BCE. Notice how thick the Doric columns are. Here is an example of some Doric columns at the Temple of Athena in Ionia from about 530 BCE. As I mentioned, Greek architects would mix styles. It's possible that Ionic styles were used in this temple as well, and that they've just been lost, with only the Doric columns surviving. Here's another example of a Doric temple. This is the Temple of Poseidon, God of the Sea, in Greece built between 444 and 440 BCE, the early classical period. As you can see, it's built primarily with the Doric order, but there are more carvings and more decoration on the column's capitals, suggesting a possible Ionic influence to this mostly Doric structure. Here's an example of an Ionic structure built at Miletus in Ionia during the 6th century BCE. Notice that the columns in the Ionic order are much thinner. We'll talk more about that later. Here is an Ionic temple built in Greece at Athens. It's the Temple of Nike. It's built near the Parthenon in the Acropolis complex, an area where both Doric and Ionic orders of architecture are used, reflecting the cosmopolitan nature of the city of Athens as they mixed different orders together. Another Ionic temple in Athens, once again highlighting how Athenian architects brought multiple architectural styles together to show the complexity and diversity of their city. Now we'll compare the Doric and Ionic orders alongside each other. The Doric order, as I mentioned, was much simpler, and it was most popular in the Greek mainland and in Greece's Western colonies. The Ionic order was more common in Asia Minor and colonies in the Eastern part of the Greek mainland, like Athens. Doric columns tend to be thicker with wider fluting which scholars argue was meant to symbolize the masculinity of Doric architecture. Ionic columns are thinner, with more delicate fluting, more ornate design on the capital as well. This design is called volutes, 
and it's believed to have represented a woman's hair, symbolizing femininity. Ancient Near Eastern influence is more evident in the Ionic order, which makes sense because it was developed in Ionia, Asia Minor. These orders could be combined and used together, even in the same building complex, as seen with the Parthenon in the Acropolis. Now we'll discuss ancient Greek agriculture and society during the Archaic and Early Classical period. Land use patterns in Greece changed after the Bronze Age collapse and the fall of the Mycenaean civilization. Instead of a large population of destitute peasants working the land to support a king and an aristocracy, farmers in the Iron Age and then in the Archaic and Early Classical periods worked the land for themselves and sold their produce at urban markets. They didn't become rich, but they became well off enough to sustain themselves. Farmers would grow grains like wheat and barley, and they would raise olive trees for oil and to eat the olives. Some even kept vineyards to make wine, and some kept herds of sheep or goats to provide milk, textiles, and meat. They also would have kept oxen to pull their plows. Olive trees, probably the most valuable of all of the Greek farmers' agricultural produce, can live for centuries, but they mature very slowly. They take at least four years to fruit, and they're an alternate year bearing crop as well, meaning that one year they'll have a very large crop, the next year they'll have a small crop, and the year after that they'll have a large crop again. The loss of a wheat or a barley crop would have been difficult for ancient Greek farmers, but the loss of an olive tree could have been cataclysmic. Olive oil had many uses in Greek society. It was an essential ingredient in their cuisine, and it could be used to make medicines and cosmetics, like moisturizers, which athletes rubbed on themselves to protect their skin during athletic competitions. Here are some images of ancient Greek architecture. On the left, we see a vase depicting farmers harvesting olives. They would use sticks to knock the olives from the tree, and they would set a blanket on the ground to catch the fallen olives, which they would collect and then either eat or dry, or they would press into olive oil. On the right, we see farmers driving oxen in their fields. The oxen can be seen pulling plows. Here's a modern artist's recreation of uh, a Greek farmer at work. You can see him uh, leading a plow of oxen. Uh, he's joined by another male, perhaps a son or a uh, paid worker who is uh, sowing, sowing seeds uh, that will presumably you know, grow to become a wheat field. Off to the, uh, in the background is a vineyard uh, where grapes will be grown, and then uh, grapes could either be eaten as fresh or as raisins, or they could be made into wine. Uh, wheat, of course, would be made into bread, and then there's olive trees as well. Olive trees uh, produce olives. Olives can be eaten, and uh, olives also can be produced, uh, used to make olive oil, which is a... Uh, essential foodstuff, cosmetic item, and medicine in uh, Greek society. And these men here might be hired laborers or they might be slaves. Many uh, farmers owned uh, slaves who worked in the fields alongside them. The ancient Greeks also uh, engaged in fishing. Remember, the Greeks are uh, a maritime people, a seafaring people, and they uh, use the ocean not only um, as a way to travel more easily than, than traveling by land, but also uh, the ocean could be a source of food, particularly for, through fishing. And fishing and fish uh, feature prominently in uh, Greek visual art. Here is a artist's modern recreation of what a ancient Greek uh, fishing vessel might have looked like. The farmers would then take their produce to the urban markets where they would sell it and purchase other goods 
like agricultural implements or livestock, which they would raise on their farms. The ancient Greeks also enjoyed wine as well. They raised vineyards, they pressed their grapes, and they fermented their grapes into wine. And they would store the wine in jars called amphora. Then they would export their wine all across the ancient Mediterranean, usually by ship. Shipwrecks often feature wine jars like these. In addition to selling goods outside of Greece, the Greeks also sold goods within Greece at uh, marketplaces in cities called agoras. Uh, the agora was an open-air outdoor marketplace, usually in the town square in the center of the uh, center of the the polis. And the agora basically replaces the megaron or great hall of the Mycenaeans. It reflects the more democratic nature of Greek society as Greek people come together in a common space to uh, buy and sell and trade goods rather than going to a centralized uh, throne room to uh, have their goods redistributed. And unlike the Mycenaean economy, which was a redistributive system, the archaic and later uh, Greek economies, even beyond the archaic period, are market-based, with people buying, selling, and trading, uh, bartering goods for themselves. And uh, Greeks bought and sold a variety of goods in the Agora. They also uh, would engage in uh, military training in the Agora, as you can see here. Uh, public meetings and uh, votes would take place in uh, the Agora, especially in places like Athens. And then, uh, unfortunately, there were also uh, slave markets, uh, the buying and selling of human beings in uh, the Agora. And really, the Agora for the Greeks was not just a place of business. It was a community center uh, for Greek culture. People would gather together, as I said, they'd gather together for military training, public meetings, the buying and selling of goods. Uh, there would be poetry recitations. There would be uh, sacrifices uh, out front of the temples. Uh, things of, of this nature uh, took place in uh, the Agora, the marketplace. Because we mentioned slave markets on the previous slide, I want to talk a little bit more about slavery in ancient Greece. Slavery played a, a major and an important role in the, the Greek economy and in the archaic period and even beyond. Uh, a lot of uh, Greek city-states, because of the amount of slaves, the number of slaves they had, will be considered slave societies, that is, societies dependent on slave labor. And because of the dependence uh, that Greek societies had on slave labor, the average uh, Greek person who was not a slave, the average free Greek person, believed that slavery was a natural and necessary system. Obviously, enslaved people amongst the Greeks would have had a different idea. And uh, slavery varied somewhat, though, from one city-state to the next. For example, Athens practiced what we would call chattel slavery, that is, slavery in which human beings are treated like property, and they're, they're bought and sold uh, like livestock often at uh, markets uh, like the one shown on this slide. Slaves could also be owned by uh, the polis, by the city-states. These were called public slaves, and they would have done things like cleaning up the streets and doing maintenance on uh, city buildings and things of that nature. In, in Greek society, slaves tended to be foreigners or barbarians brought from outside Greece. Uh, foreign captives, uh, might also be uh, from warfare might be made into slaves as well. Uh, many Greeks thought it was inappropriate to make other Greek people uh, slaves. So even as they thought of slavery as being a natural and necessary thing, they thought it was wrong and, and immoral to uh, enslave other Greeks. Uh, of course, there will be exceptions. Sometimes uh, that sort of thing will happen, even though it's considered to be taboo and immoral in Greek society. Um, Slaves in Greek society could um, purchase their own freedom if they were able to make enough money, and then they would become metics. And metics were uh, free people living in Greek society, but they were not citizens. Uh, an exception to the, the chattel slavery system, as seen in places like Athens, was a Spartan system of slavery. And the Spartan system of slavery was based around what were called the helots. And helot means captive in, uh, in Greek. 
And the helots were like slaves, but also very similar to uh, almost like medieval serfs. Uh, they were tied to the land. They could not be uh, bought and sold. They could not be separated from their families in the same way, um, in the same way that other other uh, slaves were in Greek society. And also, the helots were Greek. They were uh, Greeks being ruled over by other Greeks, Spartans. So the rule of not enslaving Greek people didn't really apply in Sparta. And there's a lot of debate about which type of slavery was better or worse for uh, slaves in, in ancient Greece. Uh, nowadays, scholars generally argue that actually the Athenian way of chattel slavery was better than uh, helotry, uh, the, the slavery of the, the Spartans, because a, um, an Athenian slave uh, could potentially purchase uh, her or his freedom and become a free person, a metic. And while they were not a citizen, um, they were free. However, amongst the Spartans, the helots were always going to be uh, in a subordinate position to the Spartans and then to free people who were um, uh, you know, living in uh, the, the Spartan society. Also, uh, the helots, even though they did not have their families separated and they were not bought and sold, uh, they did have to deal with something called the cryptea. Uh, this was a military rite of passage in which uh, young Spartan warriors would kill helots, helots that were believed to be uh, rebelling against uh, um, the, the Spartan society. Also, the, the Spartans had a lot of other really strange rules uh, designed to degrade the helots and uh, make them feel inferior. Uh, in addition to you know being killed by these crypteas, uh, they also had to like wear clothing made of dog skin, for example. Very strange uh, rules that were designed to degrade uh, the helots and keep them from rebelling. So uh, those are some uh, important things to keep in mind when discussing slavery in ancient Greece. Since we've talked about slavery in ancient Greece, a uh, very controversial subject, I also want to talk about race and ethnicity in ancient Greece, which can be controversial as well. And these uh, observations that we're going to make about race and ethnicity in ancient Greece, they don't just apply uh, to the archaic and early classical periods. Some of the observations we'll make actually will predate the archaic and early classical periods, and others will go on well into the Hellenistic period. But it makes sense to talk about um, uh, Greek ideas of race and ethnicity across uh, the entire existence of their civilization. Uh, to begin, the Greeks generally regarded their own culture and people as superior to others. Um, even though the Greeks themselves were divided into city-states, so the Greeks would have seen themselves as being better than, say, the Egyptians or certainly the Persians. But at the same time, an Athenian would think that Athenians were better than Spartans, and a Spartan would think Spartans are better than Athenians or Corinthians, etc. And the Greeks called non-Greek-speaking people uh, barbaroi or barbarians, and this is a reference to um, an onomatopoeia, basically a sound word, how they thought foreign languages sounded. It sounded like bar, bar, bar in their ears. So that's how they refer to uh, non-Greek speaking people. So language is very important to the Greeks. And when it comes to race, um, the Greeks were aware that people had different racial phenotypes. Uh, that is, different uh, appearances, you know, different skin colors, different hair textures, different bone structures. Um, that nowadays we translate as race in our mind. Although the Greeks would have interpreted these racial phenotypes, they were very aware of these things somewhat differently than we do. It's similar to the idea a couple of years ago, people were saying that the ancient Greeks couldn't see the color blue because they didn't have a specific word for the color blue, which um, people who actually understood ancient Greek history, actual classicists, point out that that was an absurd claim to make. Just because you don't have the same word for blue that we have in modern English doesn't mean that you can't see blue. You'll just have different words for the color blue. And in the same way that you know Greeks in the past could have recognized um, what we would see as races today, they just might have had different ideas about what race meant. As far as hierarchies of people, um, or perhaps you might say racial hierarchies, the Greeks believed that the best people, uh, 
um, came from Greece and adjacent Mediterranean regions. Um, Hippocrates, a very famous Greek physician, made this argument. Um, this might be called environmental determinism today, that your environment determined um, your features, the way you live, the way you thought as a person. And um, basically, they thought that Northern Europeans, people who lived to the north of them, like um, Thracians, uh, Scythians, etc., Celts, people like this, um, they often refer to them as Xanthia or, or blondes. And they thought that Xanthia people, um, Northern Europeans, were very strong, but that they had aggressive temperaments and um, they could be very dangerous to be around. That was what they uh, believed. And then when they looked at people from uh, the Middle East and from Africa, not just Egypt, but Sub-Saharan Africa as well, which they, they called Ethiopia, they assumed these people, because they lived in a warmer climate, they were um, lazy or subservient, that they were slavish even. That was a term that Greeks liked to use, that they were the kind of people who could be easily manipulated. They were not um, like Greeks who loved democracy and loved freedom. They were easily controlled by people like the Persians. So they have some very negative stereotypes about people that are not Greek. And as far as how the Greeks refer to themselves as a whole, well, they refer to the city-states they were from, um, Spartan, Athenian. They sometimes refer to the regions they were from, Achaeans, um, uh, Boeotians, an area in northern Greece, Laconians, uh, the area around Sparta, etc. But they often refer to their complexion and their appearance as uh, leucos or white, which is very interesting. And the Greeks thought of themselves as being the most balanced uh, of all people. They thought that they weren't as fiery and aggressive as Northern Europeans, those uh, um, blonde people, and they weren't um, as easily manipulated as people from Asia and in Africa were. They thought they had uh, the best of, of, of everything. And as discussed on the, the previous slide, the Greeks, for the most part, um, they preferred to enslave non-Greek people. Uh, the main exception, of course, uh, was Sparta, who enslaved the Helots, who were Greek people. But slavery was not specifically race-based. Um, Greeks would have kept uh, Thracians as slaves, but they also kept uh, Middle Eastern and um, you know, people from areas to the south as slaves as well. The term racism is a modern uh, term, uh, so referring to the Greeks as, as racist, I think, is unhelpful and just counterproductive. Some of the Greeks' beliefs about themselves and about people who are different than them uh, might be considered racist today, but I think criticizing the Greeks, uh, calling them racist, judging them by uh, modern um, ideas about race, I don't think is a, uh, a useful and uh, fair thing to do. And even as we criticize uh, the Greeks for having ideas that might be considered bigoted, chauvinistic, uh, etc., we also have to give the Greeks some credit for learning a lot from barbarian peoples. They copy many aspects of, of other cultures, uh, orientalizing styles in architecture and in sculpture. Um, they, even as they criticize people who are the, different than them, they also tried to learn from these people as well. So there's some major dualities in um, the Greek understanding of, of race and ethnicity. Their ideas are very complex, very nuanced. And the Romans will have many of the same ideas about race and ethnicity as the Greeks, particularly the idea that people from uh, sort of the northern Mediterranean region were, were the best, most balanced people. And that people further to the north and further to the south were uh, less balanced and inferior. And the image on this slide is a map of the world as the Greeks knew it um, during the uh, archaic and early classical period. This is from Hecateus. Um, they were aware of, of uh, Europe, uh, at least parts of Europe. They were aware of Asia, going to who, about where Persia and India are. And they were aware of uh, Africa, North Africa, and a little bit of Sub-Saharan Africa as well. Um, this whole region is referred to as Libya, from which we get the modern country's name, Libya. Uh, we also uh, know that they called Sub-Saharan Africa 
Ethiopia, which is where we get the term Ethiopia for the country today. On the next couple of slides, we'll look at some actual material artifacts showing uh, the Greeks' ideas of race and ethnicity. This is a uh, fresco um, from the uh, Palace of Pylos. Uh, it's from about the 1200s BCE, so during the Bronze Age or Mycenaean period. And it features a, uh, a lyre player, basically a type of harp. Um, but it shows the player with darker skin than the average um, uh, Mycenaean uh, male figure. This is um, presumably a man based on the uh, clothing and based on how the body is drawn. Uh, but his skin is quite a bit darker than uh, how like Mycenaean warrior's skin is portrayed. So it's very likely they're trying to portray a, uh, an African man or someone from the southern Middle East whose skin is a little bit darker than the olive complexioned typical Mycenaean. And this uh, is the head of a figurine showing a uh, um, Sub-Saharan African or Ethiopian as um, the Greeks would have called these people. It's from Cyprus, an island of the Mediterranean, and it's from the 900s to 800s BCE. So it's from the Iron Age or Dark Age to the beginning of about the uh, when the Archaic period begins. Moving into the Archaic and Early Classical period, uh, we have some other examples of the Greeks' portrayals of uh, different races, particularly of uh, African, Sub-Saharan African people. Uh, on the left is a um, uh, a ceramic uh, picturing Memnon. Memnon was a uh, mythical uh, figure mentioned in uh, the works of Homer, specifically the Iliad. He um, was a um, said to be an Ethiopian warrior who fought on the uh, Persian side in the Trojan War. And this piece is from between 550 and 525 BCE. So he's a, a sub-Saharan African warrior who fights for the Trojans uh, during um, the Trojan War. And he was said to be one of the best warriors that the Trojans had. He was only defeated by Achilles, uh, the best warrior the Greeks had. Um, on the other side of this slide is a alabaster perfume bottle. And it's uh, featuring a um, Ethiopian soldier in the Persian army. And we have pretty good documentary evidence to show that Sub-Saharan Africans were fighting in the Persian armed forces. Um, the, the Persians took over Egypt. They would have recruited people from surrounding regions, not just areas that they uh, controlled. And uh, we see um, this is not just something that the Persians are doing, but the Greeks are aware of it as well, as shown uh, on this uh, perfume bottle. So the Persian War would have unfortunately led um, Greeks to see non-Greek people, um, including Sub-Saharan Africans, as being their enemies because a lot of Sub-Saharan Africans uh, would have been fighting uh, in the Persian army against uh, the Greek city-states. But I want to also show some other very interesting portrayals of Africans in Greek material culture on the next couple of slides. And these um, ceramic portrayals that you're going to see um, to us in the 21st century, they, they don't look very good. They look, you might say, racist. But remember, the Greeks had a different idea of, of race than, than we do as modern people. So we want to um, look at these um, um, upcoming slides with an open mind. This is a, a drinking cup from the uh, late archaic or early classical period. Um, it's um, called a cantharos or cantaros. It was uh, found in Athens, the Attic region, um, probably made sometime between 510 and 480 BCE. And the inscription uh, on the, uh, this, this drinking vessel says, the boy is handsome. And it features uh, two women. On one side, you see a um, Ethiopian or Sub-Saharan African woman. And on the other side, you see what looks more like a, uh, a Greek woman. Someone of uh, Mediterranean European features. And these um, drinking vessels featuring uh, two heads, um, they were probably meant to represent um, actual people. The idea being that the, um, the person who bought this cup, he may not have been able to afford uh, servants or slaves, uh, 
but he might instead choose to have people represented in his cup instead to kind of imagine that he's being served by uh, two attractive women who are complimenting him on his looks. So this is probably why um, this this uh, drinking vessel was um, um, made this way and, and painted this way. And looking at the uh, portrayal of the African woman, we might say this is a very stereotypical portrayal of a black person. It's um, going to, for modern American uh, viewers, uh, conjure up images of um, what are often called mammy figurines, but that's not what the ancient Greeks were trying to do. I don't believe they were trying to stereotype African people in art like this. This is another uh, example of a uh, Kentaros. Um, this one's from a little bit later, but also from Attica. Um, it features uh, two males. It features a African male, presumably an older African man. And on the other side is a, um, a, a satyr. And a satyr, of course, they are mythical, mythical beings. Satyrs had um, human, but also horse features in their bodies and they had basically uh, mystical powers and they were kind of tricksters and troublemakers. You might argue that this um, this piece has a bit more of a negative portrayal of, of sub-Saharan Africans lumping an African man in with sort of this um, mystical uh, trickster being uh, we might say is uh, a more negative portrayal of African people. But again, we have to remember that the Greeks, their idea of race uh, is very different than our uh, modern idea of race. During the high classical period, you don't see as many portrayals of uh, African people or other uh, non-Greek people. Or if you do, they're portrayed more as being enemies of the Greeks. And I suspect this is because there was a rise in xenophobia and anti-Greek sentiment after the Persian Wars, which we might condemn that as modern people, but it's understandable within the ancient Greek contest. The ancient Greeks had survived a very um, difficult war against the Persians, against a much more powerful enemy, and they'd managed to come out uh, with their independence. Uh, intact. So you don't see as many um, portrayals of Africans and non-Greeks um, during the like high and late classical period. If you do see portrayals of non-Greeks, it's often more negative, um, more negative of, of portrayal. But during the Hellenistic period, you begin to see more portrayals of non-Greeks, especially Africans again. And this is a bronze figurine from the Hellenistic period. Um, it's a very small piece, only about seven inches tall. Um, it shows an African youth um, wearing some kind of loincloth, although it's not exactly covering up very much. Um, this is probably meant to represent a foundry worker, someone who works in a blacksmith shop, gets you know very hot from the fires, so they're wearing very little clothing. It may um, represent a slave. A lot of uh, blacksmithing uh, and foundry work was done by slaves. Remember, though, the Greeks did not single out Africans to be their slaves. They, they enslaved people of a variety of ethnicities and, and races. But the Greeks would have had more contact with African people during the Hellenistic period, as the Greeks um, would take control, particularly of Egypt. Now that we've discussed slavery in ancient Greece, we can discuss uh, gender relations in a bit more detail in ancient Greece. Uh, from the Archaic period and really beyond, uh, many of these uh, points that we're going to make about the Archaic period are true of, of later times in Greek history. Uh, as mentioned before, Archaic Greece and really Greece afterward was a very patriarchal society. Women did have basic human rights. They could appear in court. Uh, but they could not testify on their own behalf. They would have to have a, uh, a man testify for them in court, whether it was their father, their husband, a, a brother, uh, perhaps a son. Women were, however, heavily involved in the economic production in Greece, especially uh, uh, domestic ec economic production like weaving. Uh, women would work as weavers in the home, women of the middle and upper class. Um, Upper and middle class women were expected to work within the home, and really they were expected only to leave the home when it was absolutely necessary, uh, 
they would go out for religious observances and things like that. Uh, women often were priestesses in uh, Greek society. Uh, working class women were allowed a little bit more um, wiggle room in these gender relations. Working class women were more uh, more likely to be permitted to uh, work outside of the home to make money for themselves and for their families, whereas middle and upper class women were supposed to work, but inside the home for their, their husbands and their sons. And of course, a lot of these gender rules did not apply to uh, enslaved women. Um, enslaved women had to do whatever their master or mistress told them to do. Uh, women could not become citizens in the same way that uh, men could, and they could not vote. Uh, and there were also additional uh, laws about how women were supposed to dress and uh, carry themselves in public. Uh, sumptuary laws, laws about clothing. Women were supposed to keep their heads covered uh, with a scarf of some kind in public. Uh, women were supposed to oversee domestic labor, weaving cloth, as I mentioned before, raising children, uh, cooking. These things were seen as being uh, the domain of women in uh, Greek society. Uh, and women married very young in uh, Greek society. They typically married in their teens, often to men that were 10 or more years older uh, than them. And we would often, we would consider this kind of uh, age difference uh, between um, a man and a woman uh, to be uh, oppressive today in our society. But for the Greeks, this was a very normal thing. Marriages would be arranged by uh, male guardians, uh, usually uh, the potential bride's father and the potential groom's father. Women often did not have a lot of uh, say in who, who they were supposed to marry. That doesn't mean that uh, these marriages could not be loving, though. Uh, you know, men and women who were married did, did often love each other in, in ancient Greek society. Uh, these arranged marriages were, were considered to be the norm, so these are not mutually exclusive things, a relationship or a marriage of love and a relationship or a marriage of convenience. For the Greeks, they could be one and the same. And uh, women's sexuality was uh, tightly controlled. Infidelity was extremely frowned upon uh, for women. Um, there were very harsh penalties for women that committed uh, adultery, that had sex outside of marriage. For men, having sex outside of marriage, uh, it was not really a problem, so long as the, the woman that they had sex with outside of marriage was not uh, married. Uh, women uh, were, of course, uh, not permitted to have these relationships outside of marriage. Divorce was actually permitted in uh, ancient Greek society, but it had to be initiated by uh, men. So the terms of the divorce would often be very unfavorable to women. Here is a terracotta uh, lekythos, or olive oil vessel. It's from Attica, uh, 560 through 530 uh, BCE. It's in the Met uh, Gallery of uh, New York City, and it's showing a archaic Greek uh, marriage procession as uh, the bride uh, leaves her home to go join uh, the home of uh, her husband. This is a uh, patriarchal society, but also a uh, patrilocal society, meaning that the uh, bride becomes part of the groom's family. Now that we've talked about uh, archaic Greek gender relations, I want to talk about uh, ancient Greek fashion as it developed in the archaic period and would continue even beyond the, the archaic period. Compared to the uh, Minoan and Mycenaean periods, uh, Greeks wore less revealing clothing during the Archaic and Early Classical periods and beyond. Uh, during uh, the Archaic period, uh, women wore uh, tunics called uh, the peplos, uh, which would be fastened with uh, pins at the shoulder. Uh, men wore tunics called uh, that were called uh, chitons. And um, they were closed with uh, buttons or sometimes with uh, brooches. Over time, uh, women began to wear a, a version of a chiton as well, but their, their chitons were, uh, were longer and more like a dress than a tunic. Uh, both sexes would have worn uh, cloaks um, and head coverings of some kind uh, in colder weather or outside of the home. Men often wore uh, wide-brimmed hats or uh, caps of, of a variety of types, and uh, women often wrapped uh, cloaks around, around their heads, especially when they were out in public. It was considered to be a sign of modesty for a Greek woman to have her head covered in public. Uh, 
Uh, women usually kept their hair long in uh, Greek society, and they wore it in a variety of hairstyles, either up or down, uh, different types of uh, braids and styles. Uh, men in the uh, archaic period typically wore their hair long, although shorter hair would become more popular in the, the classical period, as you can see on the slide. Uh, in uh, Greek society, mature men would grow uh, facial hair. Younger men would uh, shave until they could grow a thick beard for themselves, although uh, the clean-shaven style would become a lot more popular towards the end of the uh, classical period and at the beginning of the uh, Hellenistic period. Uh, women also uh, wore cosmetics and uh, would remove uh, their body hair as well in a variety of ways. Uh, both sexes would have worn uh, open-toed sandals in uh, most weather. Um, trousers in uh, ancient Greek society, that is pants, were rarely worn uh, by Greeks and they were identified with uh, barbarian cultures. They were seen as being uh, barbaric. Here are some additional images of uh, clothing from ancient Greece from the archaic period and beyond. Uh, you can see uh, the, the chiton worn by women. Uh, it's closed uh, with uh, buttons along the uh, shoulders and arms. Uh, women's tunics are a lot longer, more like a dress. Uh, men's tunics are much shorter, allowing them to more easily move and work in the fields or to take part in combat. Reflecting the uh, gendered uh, division of labor in ancient Greek society. Perhaps the greatest Greek cultural development of the archaic and the early classical period, uh, far more so than architecture, or arts, or anything along those lines is the development of Greek democracy. Uh, before the uh, early 500s uh, BCE, uh, so for most of the archaic period, uh, a lot of the Greek city-states were ruled by kings called tyrants. Uh, and this is, of course, is monarchy, the rule of one. Um, also, uh, some, some city-states were ruled by oligarchies. Oligarchy means rule of the few. Um, and oligarchies could look like a society like at Sparta, which was ruled by a council of elders and uh, a couple of kings. We'll talk more about uh, Spartan society in a future video. In 510 BCE, uh, Athens expelled its tyrant and led by uh, the reformer Cleisthenes created the first uh, Greek democracy. And of course, uh, democracy is uh, demos, people, and kratos, power. You can see Cleisthenes here on this slide. Um, Cleisthenes is built upon the reforms of uh, the previous Athenian statesman Solon, who lived from um, about 630 to 560 uh, BCE. Uh, in Athenian democracy, adult male citizens, uh, over, men over the age of 20 who uh, were citizens, had been born in Athens, could vote. There were equal rights uh, for all citizens, uh, although only uh, free males over 20 years of age could actually be citizens, uh, not 18 year olds, not 16 year olds, you had to be 20 or older. Although there were certain uh, property qualifications for which office, political office in Athens you could hold at the time of Cleisthenes. But Athenian democracy takes different forms uh, at certain points in Greek history. This is just an overview of uh, Athenian democracy. The electorate, um, the voters, would be divided into districts. They would vote for their leaders. Uh, Athenian democracy started out as a representative democracy, uh, became a much more radical or direct democracy over time, in which things like property requirements for certain types of office were, were abolished. Uh, we'll talk more about the evolution of Greek democracy in future videos. Uh, Athenian democracy also had a series of courts uh, called dicasteria, and uh, punishments would be voted on by uh, an electorate or the assembly, basically the jury, um, would uh, pass, pass judgment. A very common punishment uh, in uh, Athenian democracy was ostracization or exile, being forced to leave uh, Athens for a set number of, of years, usually. In some cases, um, ostracization could be for life. Uh, the assembly, um, or the ecclesia, met in uh, the Athens Agora market. 
We think that democracy in Athens would not have developed without a large population of semi-independent, um, self-sufficient farmers who could feed both themselves and the city dwellers who uh, oversaw manufacture, basically division of labor, um, and then independence uh, and self-sufficiency um, helped to make Athenian democracy work. We don't think that democracy could have developed in a previous Greek society like Mycenaean society with its redistributive economy where everyone basically had to have their goods redistributed. Um, in Athenian society where uh, the population was more self-sufficient, democracy was able to develop and flourish. And um, democracy would continue to develop under the uh, reforms of Ephialtes in 462 BC and really throughout the classical period as well, with some interruptions in which uh, democracy would be suspended. But we'll talk about those uh, interruptions in a future video. Other city-states uh, during the archaic period and early classical period would develop more egalitarian uh, political reforms, but few Greek city-states went as far as Athens did in uh, their democracy. And this is one other point I want to make. To the Athenians and really to the Greeks, the idea of aristocracy uh, and democracy were not mutually exclusive. Um, to the Greeks, aristocracy meant rule of the best. That's literally what uh, democracy means. Uh, and basically, democracy was the best way to have aristocracy. The electorate would vote um, for the best, most qualified citizens and give them power. Uh, and these best, most qualified citizens would become the leaders of Athens, the archons, the strategoi, uh, etc. Nowadays, we generally think of democracy and aristocracy as being um, the opposites of each other. Aristocracy is people who have power because of their parentage, and their lineage, whereas um, uh, democracy is, is the people voting uh, to give others power. But for the Greeks, uh, aristocracy was not about lineage. It was about just being the best. It was about having the most arete. Here is an archeological excavation of the Agora at Athens, as well as an artist's reproduction of what the Agora may have looked like in archaic and early classical times. The Ecclesia met in the Agora and the courts met nearby as well. The ecclesia used pieces of pottery as ballots for their votes. They would use broken pieces of pottery, which the voters would write on, or for more important votes like ostracizations, they would use specially made clay tokens to prevent voting fraud. Now that we've discussed archaic in early classical Greek society, we can discuss how the Greek military of these periods was a reflection of Greek society and values. The backbone of the Greek military during the archaic and classical periods was the hoplite. They were named after their round shield called the hoplon. Hoplites were considered heavy infantry equipped with full armor shields and swords and spears and they would fight in close order in what was called the phalanx. Hoplites were generally not professional soldiers. They were citizen soldiers who had regular professions, especially in agriculture, and they would volunteer to fight. In some cases they were conscripts in places like Athens where the citizens, once again free adult males, were expected to fight as part of their civic duty. There were some professional soldiers and professional military classes though. Sparta had professional military classes, men trained to fight from the age of seven. Some Greeks fought as mercenaries as well. The hoplites fought in tight formations, which would have required high levels of discipline. The hoplites would be supported by cavalry and unarmored light infantry called peltasts. Peltasts were armed with ranged weapons like javelins, slings, and archers were used as well, but to a lesser degree. The Greeks preferred melee combat. As mentioned before, hoplites tended to come from agricultural communities. They were usually of middling status. They had to be in order to 
pay for their armor and weapons. Poor men who wanted to serve in the military might do so as peltasts, light infantry. Rich men were more likely to serve in the cavalry because they would have to be able to pay for their own horses. The Greek city-states frequently fought each other during the Archaic and early Classical periods, but they came together in leagues to fight external threats like the Achaemenid or Persian Empire. As you can see, the hoplite system reflected the comparatively egalitarian nature of the Greek society during the Archaic and Early Classical period. Now I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the class systems of the Archaic and Early Classical Greek military. Even though in many ways Archaic and Early Classical Greece was highly egalitarian by the standards of the ancient world, there were still uh, class systems in place, particularly in how uh, the military was uh, formed and funded. Um, in Athens, uh, the reforms of Solon, who I mentioned on a previous slide, um, basically determined who would serve in the military and in what capacity. Uh, basically, you at the top of society, you had the 500 measure men. These were the uh, wealthiest male citizens whose property or estate could produce uh, 500 measures of wealth per year. And they would serve as counselors, archons, and then strategoi or generals in uh, uh, the Greek military or the Athenian military. Underneath the uh, 500 measure men were the 300 measure men. And um, these uh, men would have served as uh, hippiuses or cavalry, uh, which um, were more on a secondary role in uh, the Greek military. Um, there were not enough uh, men who were wealthy enough to be cavalry. And these men had to have 300 measures uh, as their annual income. They were basically, we might say, lesser aristocracy. They were not the best of the best, but they were, you know, best men. Underneath the 300 measure men were the 200 measure men, uh, also known as the yoked men, um, because they were yoked together uh, in the phalanx. They were closely uh, put together in close order formations in the, the Greek phalanx. They served as hoplites, and they did not have enough money for a horse. Um, typically, these were farmers who would have had oxen, not horses. And uh, they would have been farmers of the middle class, perhaps some artisans as well, people who could afford um, the armor to be a hoplite, and who also might have been able to afford a armor bearer. Uh, they could hire an, uh, a man to carry their armor for them, or they could afford to have a slave carry their armor for them. Uh, under the 200 measure men were the, uh, the Thetes, uh, and they were uh, citizens, but they were wage laborers, working class people who could not afford hoplite armor. And they usually served as either light infantry, um, you know, men who had uh, no armor, but instead would uh, use slingshots at, to sling stones at the enemy. Uh, they'd also serve as armor bearers for the uh, 200 measure men, or they could serve as uh, rowers on naval vessels. Uh, na naval vessels uh, were very important in the Greek military. The Greeks are a seafaring society. And other Greek city-states would adopt similar structures for their citizen-soldier armies. Um, that is, if the, the city-state had citizen-soldier armies. These are men who are citizens who have civilian occupations and they will come together for brief periods to serve in the uh, military. A notable exception is Sparta, which had basically a standing army um, and had its citizens primarily serve as soldiers first, and then uh, their civilian careers were um, not prioritized. Here are some images that illustrate hoplite tactics, moving slowly and decisively in the tight phalanx formation with spears out and swords at the ready. You can see their heavy armor, their shields called hoplons, their helmets, and even their greaves to guard their legs. Here are some modern reenactors reenacting a phalanx. Sometimes the hoplites would decorate their shields with personal designs. In other cities like Sparta, the hoplites did not decorate their shields, but instead had the symbol of the city, the letter lambda, on their shields. Here are some examples uh, showing the evolution of
Greek armor, specifically Greek helmet technology across the uh, archaic and early classical period and even beyond. Um, perhaps the most famous and iconic of all uh, Greek helmets and armor uh, is the uh, Corinthian helmet shown here. And we think that Corinthian helmets began to be used in either the 700s or 600s BCE. Early examples are um, rather unsophisticated. They do have uh, very good protection, but there's not much room for the uh, wearer to um, speak or, or breathe through this very narrow slit here. Over time, um, they will make extra slits for uh, the ears so that the wearer can hear better. And they will make um, this lower slit here a little bit wider so that they can uh, um, breathe better and project their voice better. You need to be able to communicate with your uh, comrades in battle. And there's also some other um, examples of uh, Greek helmets. Um, you have uh, what's called the Illyrian helmet and it's um, provides less protection than the uh, Corinthian helmet, but uh, certainly allows for a lot more um, uh, easier vision. And it's going to be used um, up to about the 300s uh, BCE. The Corinthian helmet, uh, the most famous Greek helmet, actually seems to have fallen out of favor uh, sometime after the Persian Wars. Uh, there's other helmets as well that are less well known, like the uh, Chalcidian. Um, Chalcidian is used a little bit later, um, but it offers um, some of the same elements of the Illyrian and the Corinthian element mixed together. There's a bit of a nose protector, um, a nose guard, but there's also a lot more um, open space so the viewer can, um, the wearer can see more as they're uh, wearing the helmet. And protection is important, but being able to see uh, and hear on the battlefield also is very imp important and can save your life as well. Other helmets like the uh, Pilos or Pylos helmet um, offers uh, very, very little protection to the face, um, but um, would have been very cheap to uh, manufacture. And this helmet will be very popular during the Peloponnesian War as uh, Athens and Sparta are fighting each other and they're just running out of resources, especially Sparta. They'll adopt this uh, very simple um, Pelos helmet. It was also said uh, that the Spartans liked to wear helmets that were not very protective. That way uh, their enemies could see their faces and see that they were not afraid. They were not showing expressions of fear because of how courageous and how disciplined they were in battle. But this may have been an exaggeration to make the Spartans sound like especially fierce warriors. And then there's one more kind of helmet that's worn called the Attic Helmet that's worn uh, later on, about the uh, 300s uh, BCE. And the Romans will actually wear a version of the Attic Helmet as well. So you can see the evolution of Greek helmets over time. It becomes more important um, for helmets to um, offer better uh, vision and better uh, hearing for their wearers. Protection uh, becomes a bit less important over time. And it was probably more important for um, Greek soldiers, hoplites, to be able to see and hear better just as they were adapting their phalanx technology to make their phalanx uh, maneuvers um, quicker and, and more complex. They needed to be able to see and hear better that comes at the expense of uh, extra protection. And this slide gives some uh, perspective on the kind of helmets that the Greeks might have been wearing during the Persian War, specifically. On the right is a Corinthian helmet of the older style. You can see it doesn't have uh, ear slits, uh, but it was found with uh, a skull, the skull of its uh, wearer or owner. We don't exactly know how uh, the wearer died. Perhaps uh, he was struck uh, through the eye with an arrow. The uh, crown of the helmet shows damage, but yet the, um, the cranium of the uh, uh, wearer it does not appear to be damaged. So he likely died uh, either um, something passed through the uh, slits in the front or um, 
he died uh, from wounds sustained in uh, another part of his body. And the image on the left is a bust of a uh, hoplite that was found in Sparta. It's been thought that this bust is meant to represent Leonidas I uh, of the Battle of Thermopylae fame. And this bust shows um, a Spartan, possibly Leonidas, wearing what looks like either a um, very open Corinthian helmet or perhaps a uh, Chalcidian helmet. And it fits with uh, the old story that Spartan hoplites liked to wear helmets that were more open to show their facial expressions in battle, to show that they were not scared or frightened of the enemy while they were fighting. Here are some more views of the hoplite armor. The armor was usually made of bronze, although sometimes iron was used. Swords and spears, however, were made of iron by this point. Here's an example of a Spartan warrior. Once again, we see that he does not have a customized personal shield. He has the symbol lambda for Sparta on his shield. Interestingly, this soldier is not wearing bronze or iron for his breastplate or curious. He's wearing one made of linen, which is much cheaper, but far less protective. Here are some images of Peltasts. They wear much less armor, if any. They use javelins and slingshots, and their goal was to harass the hoplites into breaking formation. Here are some images of ancient Greek cavalry, known as the Hippias. They generally had a more secondary role in ancient Greek tactics. They were armed with javelins or long spears, basically lances, and they would attack hoplites that had been separated from their phalanxes, as shown on this relief here. The ancient Greek city-states, especially Athens, had navies to protect their trade and to protect their ports. The preferred Greek military vessel, the battleship of the day, was the trireme, a light, fast ship with three levels of rowers. Contrary to popular opinion, the rowers on these ships were not slaves, chained to the vessel, doomed to drown if it sank. They were free men who were paid a wage to row in the galleys. Usually these were poorer men who could not afford their own weapons and armor to fight as hoplites. With this background about the archaic and early classical Greek military out of the way, now we can discuss the Greco-Persian Wars. The Greco-Persian Wars were a series of intermittent conflicts fought between the Greek city-states and the Achaemenid Empire from about 499 to 449 BCE, although the conflict began a little bit before 499, but I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the Greco-Persian Wars are best documented by the Greek historian Herodotus. Later historians like Thucydides wrote about them as well. Um, as you can imagine, Herodotus being Greek his perspective on the war is very pro the Greek city-states, a very anti the Achaemenid Empire. The main reason for going to war, the casus belli, was the expansive Achaemenid Empire had taken over Greek colonies in Ionia, Asia Minor. Um, the Greek colonists of Ionia resented being in the Persian Empire, and the Greek city-states supported their revolts. In response to the Greek city-state's support of the Ionian revolts, the Achaemenid Empire, specifically under King Darius, decided it would go to the seat of the problem and invade the Greek mainland. The invasions began about 492 BCE. Both sides fought primarily with infantry, but the Achaemenids preferred large armies of light infantry, the immortals that we discussed in the previous video. The Greeks preferred smaller forces of heavily armed hoplites. Both civilizations, the Achaemenids and the Greeks, 
had developed grand strategies that fit with their civilization's strengths. The Achaemenid Empire, as you remember, was very large and populous and diverse. So they built these large multi-ethnic armies in the form of the Immortals. The Greeks were a collection of small city-states with a far smaller population. But they had a reasonably large middle class that could afford significant amounts of weapons and armor. Basically, the Greeks preferred quality over quantity when it came to armies. Here is a map showing some of the most important battles fought in Greece during the Greco-Persian War. You can see the Battle of Marathon, fought in 490 BCE, followed by the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC and the Battle of Salamis in 480 BCE after which the Battle of Plataea was fought in 479 BCE, and the major battles fought in the Greek mainland during the Greco-Persian War came to an end. We'll discuss these battles now. The Battle of Marathon was fought in September of 490 BCE, shortly outside of Athens. I'll let you guess how far Marathon was from Athens. The Greek forces from Athens primarily were heavily outnumbered by the Persian Achaemenid forces. Some scholars estimate that the Persians may have had as many as 110,000 troops, whereas the Greeks may have only had 10,000. Some scholars argue that the majority of the Persian forces were rowers taken from their ships who were only lightly armed. Either way, the Persians significantly outnumbered the Greeks. But the Greeks developed a strategy and used tactics that played to their strengths. They built a series of abatis, sharpened sticks driven into the ground, along the flanks of their forces, forcing the much larger Persian army to come straight at them. There were also marshes and hills on either side of the Greek army, funneling the Persian forces into a much larger, much smaller area. In military history terms, this is called a force multiplier for the Greeks. It allows a smaller force to face a much larger one in pieces. In the end, the battle was a massive success for the Greeks. They routed the Persians, even though they had sent out for help from Sparta. The runners, the Athenians dispatched to Sparta, had to run a lot further than 26 miles, the distance from Marathon to Athens. They had to run over 150 miles to reach Sparta. One of the runners, Phidepides, made it from the battlefield all the way to Sparta, carrying the message calling for reinforcements, only to promptly die from the exertion. Now we'll discuss the Battle of Thermopylae, probably the most famous of the battles of the Greco-Persian War. It's been portrayed in numerous forms of media, including films some of which are much more accurate than others. This slide shows images from the film 300, which came out in 2006. At the Battle of Thermopylae, fought in the summer of 480 BCE, between 70,000 and 300,000 Persians faced about 7,000 Greeks. The Greeks were led by King Leonidas of Sparta and his 300 troops. The Greeks, heavily outnumbered, held their own against the Persians at the beginning until the Persians discovered a mountain pass around the Greek position. The historian Herodotus describes how the Greeks were portrayed, leading to the Persians finding this mountain pass. The Persians then were able to surround the Greek force and destroy it. The battle was a massive victory for the Persians, but 
The sacrifice of the Greek soldiers, particularly the 300 Spartans, galvanized the disunited Greek city-states together to resist the Persians. After the Battle of Thermopylae, the Persians continued towards Athens, where they burned the city, but this act only further intensified Greek resistance. Here are some images of the pass of Thermopylae. You can see how steep the mountains are, how difficult it would have been for the Persians to pass by the Greeks without knowing the secret paths of the mountains. Here are some images of the Battle of Thermopylae. On the left is a relief of a Persian soldier, believed to be from India, actually. Um, here are some spear and arrow points found at the battle site. Here's an image of the Battle of Thermopylae. The mountain passes would have forced all the Persian immortals together, negating their large numbers, acting as a major force multiplier for the Greeks. But once the Persians found the mountain passes, they were able to surround the Greek position and destroy the much smaller Greek force. Here are some human remains found near the site. These remains attest to there being a battle in the region. As these bones often show signs of combat wounds. After the Battle of Thermopylae, the Persians destroyed the city of Athens, which only served to galvanize the Greek city-states against the Persians. Although the Athenians had lost their city, they had not lost their navy, which was their greatest military asset. The Athenian strategos, or general Themistocles, recognized that uh, the Greeks, and Athens especially, would need a large navy to defeat the Persians. He wanted to play to the strengths of the Greek people, which are uh, seafaring strengths, uh, their naval strengths. The Persians were not a seafaring civilization uh, in the way the Greeks were. Most of the Persian uh, navy was actually made up of other, other, um, other cultures, the Phoenicians, the Egyptians, even some uh, Ionian Greeks that had been basically pressed into service uh, of Persia. So uh, Themistocles wanted to take advantage of the uh, naval weakness of the Persians and the division of the Persian uh, navy in order to uh, defeat them. Themistocles used silver from a mine discovered at Lorium in uh, 483 BCE to pay for this fleet. Uh, that mine uh, held over 100 talents, or about 100 million uh, U.S. dollars today. And the uh, silver was minted into coins, uh, which were used to purchase these ships. Coin-making technology was actually from Anatolia, from the east. But uh, the Greeks adapted or adopted uh, coin-making during this period, minting of coins during this period. Uh, Working-class Athenian men, uh, the Thetes, um, who could not afford to become hoplites, could serve as rowers on uh, Athenian warships called triremes. Here is a uh, modern-day spelunker uh, investigating the Lorium silver mines outside Athens. And these mines were, uh, the silver from these mines were used to fund the uh, Athenian navy. Here are some Athenian uh, tetradrachmae or Athenian coins. These are minted probably between 465 and 462 BCE, so a little bit later than uh, Themistocles. Uh, but they feature the uh, uh, bust or profile of Athena, and then the, uh, the owl, the symbol of Athena and the symbol of Athens. Here are some uh, reconstructed images of triremes. Uh, triremes were called triremes because they had three uh, rows of oars. Uh, triremes typically had about 200 uh, crew aboard, uh, mostly rowers, but there would be a complement of uh, 8 to 10 archers and hoplites who would fight on the upper deck basically as marines. Um, and uh, during battle, the uh, sails would be uh, pulled down and then the ship would just be powered by its oars. Uh, triremes were very fast and very maneuverable even without a keel and a rudder. Instead, the, uh, they were actually steered by uh, two large oars on uh, the back of the ship, at the stern of the ship. Uh, but these ships were uh, very unstable in open sea because of these you know, large open areas. 
so they would actually have to be put ashore at night uh, so that sailors could rest in peace and not uh, worry about their ship sinking as they as they slept. Uh, and of course, conditions aboard these uh, triremes were very unpleasant, uh, very cramped, dirty, uncomfortable. Uh, people in the rows above you, uh, sweating on you, uh, you know, very, you know, people bleeding on you or uh, other, other, uh, you know, really uncomfortable, dirty, uh, cramped conditions. So uh, even though this was a good way for uh, poor men to serve in the, the Greek military, it could be very dangerous and very unpleasant as well. And also remember that these men were not slaves. They were not galley slaves. They, they were there uh, of their own volition uh, because military service was part of their citizenship. But the service still could be very, very difficult at the same time. Here is a, uh, another modern recreation of a Greek trireme. Uh, you can see a uh, ram on the front of the vessel. Um, these triremes, they would uh, row into battle and they would try to uh, sink uh, enemy ships with their rams. The Greeks were, uh, their ships were much more maneuverable than the Persian vessels, so they had an easier time sinking the Persian ships. Also, uh, archers and uh, hoplites would be on the upper decks to uh, fire at the, uh, uh, fire, you know, arrows at uh, enemy, enemy ships. These recreated vessels are based on archaeological research, based on documentary sources about ancient Greek ships, but there's also quite a bit of speculation that goes into building these vessels. So uh, archaeologists work together with engineers and uh, shipbuilders to try to uh, figure out what these, uh, how these ships were built and then how they would have performed in, uh, in battle. And actually they'll take uh, modern people and they'll have modern people row these ships to see how fast they could go how maneuverable they were. Uh, this is called uh, experimental archaeology for, for those that are interested in uh, ar archaeological terminology. And again, these uh, triremes, even though they were very effective in, in naval combat, they were not uh, very good on open seas. They All of these open compartments uh, meant that the ship could take on water very easily and they would uh, basically be uh, bounced around in the waves and they could sink very easily. So ideally, uh, triremes would put ashore at night uh, to try to avoid uh, storms and to give their crews a rest. In the wake of the destruction of Athens, the Greek Navy fought a Persian armada at Salamis on the 26th to the 27th of September, 480 BCE. The Greek Navy was outnumbered four to one, but it won a major victory thanks to its faster trireme ships. Their strategy was also better. They forced the much larger Persian fleet to face them in a small bay, negating the Persian fleet's much larger size. Keep in mind that many of the uh, Persian vessels were actually Ionian Greek vessels that had been pressed into service in the Persian armed forces. The Greek vessels, though, were faster, and they rammed the Persian ships and sank many of them, ultimately routing the remaining Persian ships. These are some shots of a underwater archaeological excavation, an investigation of a uh, Greek port at Salamis. Uh, this port probably would have been used as a naval command center for the uh, Greek Navy, which would have helped uh, the Athenian uh, vessels coordinate and launch at the right times to attack the, uh, the Persians. And you can see the uh, diver investigating uh, the foundation of the, uh, the port here in this slide. And you can also see that um, archaeologists, underwater archaeologists, have uh, erected barriers around the site. That way uh, the water can be pumped out and they can uh, investigate the site without having to put on a diving suit and be underwater because underwater archaeology is very challenging and can be very dangerous as well. The Greek naval victory at Salamis greatly weakened the Persian military's invasion of Greece. It led to the Battle of Plataea in August of 479 BCE. In the Battle of Plataea fought to the south in the Peloponnesian pe Peninsula 80,000 Greeks defeated between 70 and 120,000 Persians. In this battle, both sides were a lot closer in size, 
The Persians, under General Mardonius, were overconfident. They charged the Greek position, only to be pushed back after General Mardonius was killed. The Persians had some Greek subjects and allies fighting on their side, but these Greek conscripts fought poorly, probably due to low morale. They probably didn't want to fight with the Persians against other Greeks, especially after what happened at Thermopylae in Athens. In the end, the Greeks were victorious at the Battle of Plataea, and their victory there brought an end to the major Persian invasions of the Greek mainland. After the battle, the Greeks would go on the offensive and retake their colonies Ionia until about 449 BCE when the Greeks made peace with the Achaemenid Empire, emerging from their conflict with Persia victorious. The Greco-Persian Wars were a very significant event in both Greek and Achaemenid history. The war weakened the Achaemenid Empire, setting the stage for its defeat by Alexander the Great in the 330s BCE. At the same time, it strengthened the Greek city-states, specifically Athens and Sparta. The war strengthened and galvanized Greek identity and culture prompting the cultural achievements of the late classical period. It brought the city-states together, but only temporarily. Former allies, Sparta and Athens would go to war against each other in the Peloponnesian War of 431 through 404 BCE. This conflict weakened the Greek city-states and set the stage for the Macedonian takeover of Greece in 338 BCE, leading to the Hellenistic Age. Conclusion Greek culture developed significantly during the Archaic and Early Classical period. Pottery, sculpture, and architecture advanced significantly and became more sophisticated. Initially, the Greeks borrowed from other cultures, but they soon became innovators in all of these fields. Greek society was more egalitarian and democratic during the Archaic and Early Classical period, once again, by the standards of the ancient world. The Greek social arrangement in this period, small farms, an agricultural middle class, inspired the hoplite system, which allowed the greatly outnumbered Greek city-states to defeat the much larger Achaemenid Empire. Additionally, this agricultural system facilitated the rise of Greek democracy as well. We'll discuss Greek democracy and Greek culture further in our next video.